Hey y'all, welcome back to Biblically Blonde. In this video, we're gonna go over Genesis 22, which is the story of Abraham's test. So if you wanna know more about this, then keep watching. Alrighty y'all, welcome back. My name's Lacey if you're new here, and this is Biblically Blonde. Biblically Blonde seeks wholehearted living for Christian women, and we do that in many ways. One of the ways we do that is through Bible literacy. Right now we're going through Genesis, and a quick note if you have been following along with this, I'm only going to be doing about three more videos on Genesis. I'm going to finish part one on the story of Abraham. So when we wrap up Abraham's story arc, we're actually gonna take a break from Genesis. I'm gonna do some more kind of wholehearted living focus videos. And then in about April, we're gonna come back and finish up Genesis. So that's the plan. I'm not gonna just stop halfway and not finish it, but I am taking a break because I've been doing Genesis for quite a few months now. So just to jump right on in, what happens in Genesis 22? Now, a lot of people know this story because it's one of the most popular stories to do about Abraham, and it's quite well known. It's essentially the story of where Abraham almost sacrifices his son Isaac, but the Lord stops him. So that's kind of like a one sentence idea of what actually is happening, but let's dig a little deeper. So we start Genesis 22 out sometime later after Isaac has been born. So the last that we see, Isaac is born, he's weaned from his mother Sarah, and then Abraham's first son, or his oldest son that he had with Hagar, who was a handmaiden or a slave, um, she was sent away and so was Ishmael. And so now the only son, his true son with Sarah, the one who is the promised son, is living with him and no other sons or children are living with Abraham. And it's quite some time later. We're assuming maybe 15 years or so. So this is many years down the line and not much has changed. They're still living um, kind of as these pilgrimers, these nomads. He has um, created for himself a home. He's living in the area of Beersheba. Um, we've seen that with him in Abimelech, the king. They have been kind of um, multiple times now interacting, and so he is in a permanent location, but it's only for about 20, 30 years or so. It's not going to be his permanent home forever. Um, he's always going to be getting up and moving as God tells him, but this is the most or the longest time he's actually in one location, and that was in um, the last Genesis 20, 21, and now in 22, we still see that he is many years later still at this location. So it tells us in scripture that sometime later, God does appear again to Abraham and he commands him to take his son and that he should go to a mountain that's about a three days journey and he should sacrifice him as a burnt offering. Now, Abraham obviously is taken aback and doesn't really want to do this, but early the next morning, right away, he goes on this journey. He takes his son, Isaac, and a couple other of their servants, and they go on this three-day journey. When they arrive at the mountain at which the burnt offering is to be done at, he leaves the servants down at the bottom of the mountain, and him and Isaac alone climb up the mountain. And as you read in scripture, they get very, very close to actually allowing this burnt offering to happen. Isaac actually at one point asked his father, where's the offering? Like, what's going on here? And Abraham says, the Lord will provide the offering for us. So it gives us a sight that Abraham knows that no matter what, God is going to do the right thing. God will provide in some way. He doesn't know if that means that Isaac is going to be resurrected from the dead or that God's going to intervene. He's not sure, but what he does know is that the Lord will provide, and that is what he repeats to his son Isaac when Isaac inquires about what the heck is happening. It tells us in scripture that right before the burnt offering was about to take place, Isaac is bound up and probably scared out of his mind. The Lord calls to Abraham and says, do not touch the boy. And out in the distance, they see what they can, an animal, to actually be the burnt offering. And so the God, God does provide an offering and instructs Abraham to not touch the boy at all. 
So that is the majority part of Genesis 22. There is a real small section that is actually very important that is Genesis 20 through 24, and a lot of people overlook it. But essentially, when they get back to their home after this huge ordeal, Abraham learns that his brother has had multiple sons, 12 in all, and they've had children and they've had children and so on and so forth. And so while he is separated from his family, his family has actually grown. And we're going to actually see Rebecca, who will be Isaac's wife, comes from Abraham's extended family. And so we see here that he is growing in numbers, even though he himself only has one son, he is still having his family line expand and expand and expand. And a quick note here before we move on to the why does this happen. When we're going over what happens, I love the verse 17 where God is telling him, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. That is kind of the final promise to Abraham. God has been giving him, you know, little little seeds of promises, not telling him the full story this whole time. Abraham's been kind of trugging along. And finally, the Lord's going to kind of wrap it up with Abraham and say, this is what's going to happen. This land you're living in, you will come. Your generations to come will occupy this land. They will cast out the enemies and they will live here. And so that obviously is going to kind of give us a hint of what's to come in the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy, Numbers, and things like that. Um, but it's the, it's the final promise. It's saying there's more to this story than what you realize. So why does this story happen? It's one of the most well-known stories of the Bible. Why? Well, it's to show Abraham's true promise and who he is as a person. Abraham is very flawed, especially in, well, he's only in Genesis, but I was going to say especially in Genesis, but about his whole story arc. He's very flawed. He repeats sins. He doubts the character of God. He doubts God in other people. And he's very fearful. He questions God a lot. And finally, we get to a point where Abraham is truly worthy of the promise to be the father of so many generations to come. It is the proving of his worth in a way. Not in his worth to be saved, but in his worth of this distinguished figure. So while we are all saved by grace, Abraham actually has such a unique title to be the father of so many to come. And through his line will come Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so he is proven to be honorable. He puts all of his trust in the Lord, like what he says to Isaac when Isaac comes to him and says, where's the offering? What's going on? He says, the Lord will provide. And so it's a way it's a justification for Abraham. He spent a lot of his life doing the wrong thing and having doubt. And finally, in his old age, he is trusting in the Lord. He is not questioning him. He's not doubting him. He's doing what the Lord commands and believing that the Lord will provide. So what does this story tell us about God? Well, I want to make it clear here. It does not tell us that God wants child sacrifice. Actually, throughout the Bible, this will never occur again. God will actually, throughout the laws and various times, throughout the prophets and, and things like that, say that this is wrong. This is something that the people who are not of God will do. So child sacrifice is off the table. It was always off the table. It wasn't even on the table when this event occurred. This was a test. Um, Isaac was not hurt. I, not, no harm came to Isaac. This is not something he's going to ask of you or of me. Child sacrifice is not something God's about. This actually tells us more about what's to come with the Son of Christ, though, or the, or the Son of Christ, uh, with the Son of God, Christ. And it tells us that God will always provide. Once again, that line of Abraham is so important here. He does provide. And later on, many, many years, years down the line, when we get to the New Testament, we're going to see that while Isaac, the son of Abraham, did not have to be sacrificed, God's one and only son will have to be sacrificed. And so while he will never require that of us ever, 
he does it himself. He sacrifices his only son, the perfect son, Jesus Christ, on the cross for us. He provided that. It is not in God's you know, rule book that he had to provide this amazing savior for us. He didn't have to. He did it anyway. And so what we can learn from the story is that God will always provide. And it tells us that not only does he provide for Abraham in this unique circumstance, but he provides for all of us and our sins later down the line with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So how can we apply this story in our daily life? Well, what are we withholding from God? What are we idolizing? What is the most important thing to us? These aren't bad things. I mean, obviously we don't want idols, but having things that are important to us aren't bad. It wasn't bad that Abraham really valued Isaac. It was his only son with his wife, Sarah. Of course this mattered to him. And we have things in our life that really matter to us. The only problem is when we put that before the Lord. And so this was a test. Does the thing that matter to you, that matters to Abraham most, his son Isaac, his heir, the promises to come and so forth and so on, are you willing to give that up for your love for Christ? And so how we can apply this is figuring out what it is that we hold the highest above in our life and questioning whether or not we're putting that before the Lord. It's not wrong to have things that we value. It's not wrong to have things that we love or people that we love. We just always want to make sure that we're putting God above it all. Alrighty, y'all, that was Genesis 22, Abraham's test. I hope I helped you maybe understand it a little more and grow on your journey to understanding God's word and closer to him than ever before. So don't forget to subscribe and like if you liked this video. I can't wait to see you next time. We're going to finish up the story of Abraham. So I have about two, uh, maybe three more videos on him. And then we're going to wrap up Genesis part one. I'm going to move on to a few videos um, dealing with more lifestyle content, wholehearted living content. And then in April, we're going to come back and finish up Genesis. So whenever you're watching this, just know eventually we're going to finish Genesis. <laughs> All right, y'all. I'll see you next time. Bye.